take this opportunity to welcome David Lowman to us, the Baytown Sun, and Alan Swenson of Lee College, who is videotaping the program. Uh, we're delighted to have the display that uh, our panel has brought, but we also have a poster over here that was made by the Airlings, and it's on uh, Texas Schools, Texas Heroes in Baytown Schools. And I hope after the program there'll be time that you can enjoy these things and also enjoy our art display that we have from Rosella Owens and Suzanne Hemphill. Well, tonight we're going to take a look at the school administration, and we're so glad to have with us Winnie Brown, Eddie Frank Green, Knox Beavis, and Henry Armstrong. Uh, we'll start off tonight with Winnie Brown. Who I'm sure most of you know, uh, Winnie and her husband lived for about 40 years in Baytown, and now they live in Bryan. And we're so pleased that they made a special trip to be with us tonight. Winnie? It's real good to be here. Orville and I always thoroughly enjoy coming back to Baytown. And uh, we have spent 45 years our lives here in Baytown, and we were talking about it the other day, and those have been the happiest years of our life. We um, always had such wonderful cooperation and the, uh, from the community and the school, whole school system. It, it's always been a joy to, to be here, and when we think of Baytown, we always think of it with very pleasant memories, so we're very happy to come back. It's uh, amazing, really, how um, we've been asked to, uh, the panelists here have been asked to talk on the uh, early years of the school system. It just doesn't seem that it's been that long. And it's always uh, so good to see students and see uh, faculty. Um, it's always hard to keep up with the names of the, of the students. Usually I can keep the faculty real well, but. Uh, not long ago, Orville and I were coming from Dallas, and we stopped in Carson County to get some gasoline. I decided I'd get out, stand up while uh, he was taking care of the gasoline. So um, I looked over and saw this uh, little old man who came toddling along with a beard, and uh, he was coming toward me. So I thought, well, I wonder why he's coming. And about that time, he said, Miss Brown, remember me at Lee? So you never know where you're going to, uh, where you're going to see them. I, I'm a little bit better though than the two little ladies. The two little old ladies were sitting in this thing uh, all afternoon, and one said to the other, "said What is your name?" And the other one said, "How soon do you have to know?" You know, um, I mentioned a while ago that it really is, is just has been amazing to me to think we're talking on the early about the early years here in Baytown because it just doesn't seem that long, and uh, it just seems like yesterday that um, we came, we married, came to Baytown in 1940, and we had a very small little apartment over on Clark Street which was right close to Horace Mann, of course. And so one afternoon, I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to stay in this very long. <laughs> stay in here when I don't know a single person in Baytown. And uh, so um, I decided to go over and uh, apply for a substitute job. So I went over and Truett Crager was principal at that time. So he was nice enough to ask me in and have a conference. And uh, so I left wondering if I'd ever get to substitute. But the next morning, real early, the telephone rang, and Orville answered the telephone, and he came back and told me it was for me. And so after I came back to the breakfast table, he said, uh, who was that calling so early? And I said, it was Truett Crager. Who is he? And so I said, well, he's principal over at Horace Mann. And he asked me to substitute today. And he said, how on earth did he know about you? That's the way I started out in the school system. 
did work with the education agency uh, for a year. And uh, then uh, Emory Anderson asked me to uh, teach a couple of classes in Lee College. So then uh, Mr. Sparks asked me to teach a couple in Robert E. Lee. So from then on, I really uh, just got in a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. After we weren't harsh enough to have any children, well, we decided to be real nice to love everybody else's children. So we have uh, thoroughly enjoyed all of the uh, children we've had contact with here. When uh, uh, Robert E. Lee was built, it was just one building. And, uh, and it was just really, when we came, it was one building. So uh, through the years, of course, it was, uh, we had uh, many additions to it. And one of the first uh, that I remember a whole lot about was the auditorium. We uh, had the auditorium. Some of you don't remember the way it was probably, but it was uh, <coughs> in the center of the building where the office space is at Poppy. We had a terrible time trying to fit all those offices into the space where the auditorium was. But anyway, um, I still remember some of those assemblies that we had, which were so uh, great. Melina was one of our students there who helped in putting on some of those uh, assemblies. And our, we felt our students were very fortunate because we had um, outstanding speakers because some of our refining companies, it was then, um, were very kind and generous in that they would call us and uh, tell us what speaker they were going to have for their executives. And then they'd say, do you think you can arrange an assembly? And I always said, oh, yes, we, we'll be able to work out an assembly. Sometimes it was a little bit difficult to convince Mr. Sparks that we needed that time for that assembly. But we had uh, uh, speakers just like, um, well, speakers that few people, uh, few students over the whole United States were privileged to hear because we had uh, Dr. Teller, this outstanding scientist. We had uh, Dr. Robert Sutherland, who was head of uh, Foundation. We had Dr. Nicholas Nirotti, who was um, from Austria, and um, all students had enjoyed him everywhere, wherever he spoke. And we did get have him back to Sterling later. But we had uh, assemblies every week, and the student council worked with those assemblies, and um, instead of having um, an administrator, call the students to order like we had been having while we had a student who was chairman. And then we had the pledge and the prayer, uh, which, uh, and, and the flag was brought in and the uniform bearers. So it was really um, uh, very uh, impressive for the students. As, as we went along, I thought about trying to take uh, Lee year by Lee, uh, year, and then uh, turn it over to Henry when he started. And then I thought about, well, how would we do with Sterling year by year? So I was just kind of trying to take a few highlights. I had brought um, a couple of annuals, uh, two from Lee. Uh, one is 1945 and one is 1950. I had some others, but I think during our move, some of them were maybe placed in the attic, <laughs> and I haven't been able to find all of them. And then I brought the first one from Sterling. <coughs> but um, during 1943 and 94, as you remember, we were very outstanding in football, and uh, had, uh, well, we just, I think football must have put Baytown on the map during that time. We have a a friend who lives across the street from us in Bryan who um, played football in Port Arthur. And I believe he can tell us, tell you more about Dan Stallworth and the team during that time than any of you could tell because he said it was the hardest team they ever saw. They couldn't really just, had got, at first they could always win. They said they just got to where they lost all the time. Um, 
during this time, um, there was a, there were a lot of activities going on, and uh, Slick Ellis and George Wamsley decided in 1944, 43 and 44, that, that we should have an annual. We hadn't been having an annual. I hadn't had one since the war had started. And so uh, they decided if they could sell 200 annuals, they would be able to, uh, we'd be able to have one that year. So sure enough, they did, and um, got their money together, and uh, <coughs> George was the treasurer. He came in one day and said, uh, you know, um, Ms. Brown, we need to go over my books because uh, they don't balance. And so I said, well, maybe we better. <laughs> I said, don't tell Mr. Sparks until we get through going over them, though. And uh, so I said, how, how much I balance up? They had a whole nickel. And so, <laughs> so um, we had uh, had our ups and downs in some of those, uh, during some of those days. But Jane Mitchum had uh, agreed to uh, work with them with the annual. So the annual turned out in, in perfect shape. They also decided we ought to have a senior prom that year. So um, along with Bill Taylor and George and Slick and, and um, a bunch of the others, Dot Wesner and uh, I believe Walena had already, uh, I believe she was a year behind me. But anyway, they uh, decided they could arrange it. And we hadn't had any senior proms. We didn't know much about how we were going to work that out. But um, they were able to, to get the community house. And I thought so many times, wouldn't the uh, seniors now uh, think that was <laughs> a big party if they went to the community house for a senior prom? But anyway, it turned out that they decorated and it did real well. Um, then in um, one of our uh, later years, why we had uh, had this big banquet over at the San Jacinto Inn. And um, I believe that was 43 that Dan Stallworth had said, well, let's, let's try to get San Jacinto Inn. And so um, we did, and we were able to, uh, to have one of our early banquets, uh, football banquets there. You'll notice that we have close up to Robert E. Lee over here on the voting board. And um, that was um, during some of the time there where it was, I believe that was uh, 1965, I believe. One of the high points um, for our banquets, later, one of the banquets later on that we had was uh, the speaker was Bear Bryant. So we really felt that was um, something to have a speaker like Bear Bryant. And fortunately, the uh, some of his friends who were able to help get him here brought him out to our home that uh, evening after he spoke. And that was the first time I knew how he uh, got his name Bear Bryant. I'm sure all of you probably knew before that time. The, um, I want to talk a little bit about our academic work was very, very uh, strong at Lee. Um, we um, had had to have self-evaluations, and then we had committees who came and checked us, and we were always so nervous during that time, but they were always uh, very complimentary, and, uh, but we didn't know whether they would be or not. We were always afraid that students would uh, want to show off or something, but we were very fortunate, and our um, scholastic tests were starting, uh, we started our guidance department in 1949, and then uh, started giving the scholastic aptitude the next year. Um, at Robert E. Lee, we uh, gave a test on Saturday, and students had had to go to uh, Galveston and Beaumont or Houston to take the test. And they always said by the time they got there, they were so frightened that they um, driving that distance that they couldn't do well on the test. So we decided to be well to apply for them of the testing program here, so um, we, we were permitted to give them give the test there on Saturdays. Maybe we still do, and it's probably going to tell us some more probably about that. Those aptitude tests were, were difficult, but our students did well on them. 
So many decisions that had to be made. For instance, the name. There were 75 names turned in. And uh, then we had this committee who sifted down and sifted down. And uh, I won't go into some of the names that were turned in. But finally it was decided on Ross Sterling. Well, then we had the color committee. So the color committee said, well, had to be one, one, one color had to be silver because of the Sterling and, of course, I was just really anxious for one color to be blue and uh, tried to avoid uh, 
saying much about it, but anyway, but it, I came out lucky on that. And then the mascot, we had various mascot names turned in, like Thunderbird and, and just many, many. I think there were about 85 turned in. So then uh, it was decided that the ranger um, should be. And then there was the design of the ring, the clash ring. And just, we could just go on and on for all of the um, things that, that um, really had to be, so many decisions that had to be made. The, um, we had our um, building pretty well completed when we moved in on September the 1st, 1966, but we didn't have any seats in the auditorium, and so we couldn't have a dedication. So we had to have our, we had our pep rallies in there um, because we couldn't walk on the gym floor. But um, we also um, we had to wait about every assembly and make an announcement and put everything there. So uh, we finally had our dedication then in February, on February the 15th, um, 1967. And I have some pictures up here of that. But, um, we did have open house, though, in August before we opened school uh, in, that, in September, on September 1st. So um, we didn't have a football field, and we didn't have a baseball field. So we had to go out to see the ball, practice baseball, and practice football. And of course, as you know, all the practices for four years were all in vain, it looked like. We, um, and all the principals, uh, we had, when I would see them in meetings or various places, would say, uh, you won't have any spirit, you won't have any team for about five or ten years. And I thought, well, I'll never just never see us win then. But we did get to go to state before I left. So um, we, in our um, academic work, we had to uh, be approved, of course, by our uh, Southern Associations of Schools and Universities. And um, I know Henry well remembers the time we went to Miami, and that was my first experience at a principal's meeting. And uh, we could tell you a lot about the, <laughs> the conditions that were there around the hotel at that time. But anyway, um, I said to Mrs. Sparks, don't you think it's a little too early? That was the first year. All the things that we had to do, and all the first handbooks, the faculty and staff, and and for um, the students and the parents and, and he said, uh, you know, he had a pretty um, convincing way uh, of saying, well, we need to do this. So Mr. Mr. Gentry was the one who uh, said, well, you, you just have to, you just have to go uh, because we have to get that straightened out as soon as we can. So we did, and then later we had the visiting committee, and they said very nice things about our and student body. In fact, they said they kept thinking that they, something would pop because they said that the students wouldn't, uh, wouldn't couldn't, couldn't be like that more than one day. And uh, but they went for three days, so they did pretty well at that time. I uh, think that uh, we'd love to hear more and more about what's going on in the school. So. I'm, uh, I've taken too much time, I know. But you know, when you get started, it's hard to quit. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, Eddie Frank Green was principal at Carver School in the years 1954-1966, and he'll tell us about that. Thank you. All of the big town and educational enthusiasts. That's all of them. All, all the faces I see out here, I saw them somewhere, either in school or part of the school program and activity. So I'm happy to see you again. And I'm happy that I was invited to serve in this capacity. I hope that you want too long now. Uh, to me, this is a memorable occasion. I think this is one of the few times my wife heard me speak to a group of people in the 
big time. Oh yes. She was always busy doing something else with her music somewhere else when I spoke. All right. I enjoyed Mrs. Brown. She could have gone on and on listening to Mrs. Brown tell about what happened with Lee and Good record, a memorable record. We put two schools in the same time. Not at the same time. I wrote Mr. George Gentry in 1954 when I had heard that a personal friend of mine had killed himself down in Baytown as principal of Carl High School. Every time I told somebody that I had gotten in touch with Mr. Tinter or applied for a job or made an effort to get the job, so well, you won't go down there for so you can shoot yourself too. So they just knew that the job caused William Aaron Davis to be so concerned about it that he killed himself. Well, nobody's ever found out why, and that is our business either way. So it was William Aaron Davis was a principal before Eddie Frank Green. I didn't hear from Mr. Gentry, so I called him over the telephone and asked him would he see me. He said, I don't know when I will be able to be approaching a 4th of July holiday season here, so I can be there the day before 4th of July or the day after, whichever day you need me here. I said, well, come on, I'll be home. My wife and I drove from Abilene, Texas, down to Baytown and saw him on Friday, I think, 4th of July, Friday that particular time. And we talked, and the next morning, Sally said, you come, well, he said, you come to the office in the morning before we need to talk some more. And I'll need to have be released before the trustees was done with the Board of Education. I was there and waiting for him when he got there. But I sure didn't want to make an impression. When he asked Mrs. Fisher, who was his secretary at that particular time, to get my application, she lived through a stack as tall as she was and she didn't find it. She went to another stack looked through it and she didn't find it. So Mr. Tinchy, I don't find my EF Green, my Edward F. Green, my Eddie Frank Green application. So I don't know what else. All I know is if look behind that door, um, a stack back there, that you find. You find. And she looked and when she got to almost to the bottom of that stack, she found this application. There's one thing that you said in this application that impressed me, and the thing that made me decide to invite you or to accept your invitation to come down here, and that was that you had lived long enough to know something about the experience that we had lived through in these years. And that was the year. 1954, and all of us know what happened in 1954. So, and because you said that you understood some of the problems, you lived with them, you had experienced them, you were a part of some of the problems, I thought it would be well to give you some consideration. And that's why I ask you to bring your wife so that you can be you and your wife and meet members of the school board. It just so happened that the combination of music teacher, principal, was the kind of a thing that went together. Although Mary, when Mary Davis' his wife didn't teach here, she was still a musician, but in many of the schools that were combination of the principal of the school and the music teacher of the high school, 
and we just take them out. So we came. And my wife had chided me about knowing where I was going. Well, there were two or three ways you could go from Houston to Baytown at that time. I came one way and went back another way. I think that confused me. In fact, I got lost. But on my way back down here that Saturday morning, I had to stop and ask the ticket station man in Baytown where the superintendent's office was. And he couldn't tell me. I don't know. The way just now, I think I got more here. You know, he called the boy that he had, and he told him, yeah, this is Martha Street here. Let's go straight down this street right here. And when you get to it, it's a tumble of my building. And that's the suit to the And when I got in my car, my wife talked to me, lectured me all the way to the suit and so of all the things on the fire for the Christmas ship of school man got since my father and Rich know where you're going. Well, I had to accept it because I was on my way to the city didn't so I maybe you need to know that I had had the good fortune of having three wives. And that wasn't this particular wife. I was the other wife. <laughs> so this one won't be chided or blamed for all the problems. Yes, she had some of her own. And I'm going to relate tonight, and especially the one that I have mine. I got the job up. My first, my second wife and I got the job. And we started working. I found Carver School in a good winning over, good winning condition. Uh, at that time, they were following Robbie Lee in the town. And Robbie Lee was on the band stall where was outstanding. And John and Pete were, and all that group of folk that followed John and Pete were straight hand, Robert straight hand. And I'm trying to think of the hell, I can't think of this. Rod Hutchins, all those outstanding football players, track coaches, basketball, and all. So they made out of Carver what they had seen over and observing across the railroad track over there at Robbie Lee and Brian Carver High School. They came to the word of the state. If you haven't played a game of football, unless you play John people that of our school in Baytown. But it wasn't just athletics that made Carver School outstanding then. They believed in participating in everything that you could participate in. It just so happened that while you were endeavoring with the UIL 